Mr. Lear, please scroll back the tape and read the testimony from the beginning, Magistrate Spencer said. I must confess that at this point Peter Lear drew my utmost sympathy, and in fact I cringed on his behalf when shortly after he'd followed Magistrate Spencer's instruction. Lear cleared his throat and read, The saddest part was, just before I killed my new husband, in our matrimonial bed there'd been contrapuntal moons. Whether Lear had mistakenly written contrapuntal moons, and therefore had read it correctly, or whether he'd simply mispronounced moans, I did not know. Either way, no amount of gavel-pounding could fend off the ensuing laughter. It just went on and on. Even Elizabeth Frame shook her head back and forth, incredulous. Peter Lear had, in equal measure, a look of despair and embarrassment. He tried to carry on with reading the transcript, but Spencer said, Mr. Lear, it's fine. Please, cease and desist. It's all right. It's fine. The gavel took effect this time. Mr. Lear, Spencer said, you do realize, don't you, that at night, when we gaze at the heavens, we are able to see only the one moon? I do realize that, Lear said. I'm so relieved, Spencer said. He flicked through the dictionary, stopped at a page, and read, Erratum, an error in speech or printing. Let's call it an erratum, then. Speechless, Peter Lear stared into the middle distance. But the proceedings had gone off the rails, and Spencer did the correct thing by saying, Let's resume this hearing tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Spencer left the dining room. He'd put in about two hours of work for the taxpayers of the province. As for Peter Lear, when he stood up from his chair, he knocked the stenograph machine off its stand, though managed to catch it, and thus spared himself more humiliation. It's a particularly fragile instrument, I'm told. Meville Cousins escorted Elizabeth Frame from the room. She embraced her mother on the way, and then the rest of us filed out of Ottawa House. Coffee and a cheese sandwich for lunch in my room. Then I spent some of the afternoon talking to people. I had particularly hoped to track down anyone who might have seen Elizabeth immediately after the gunshots. Often the kind of long articles I write for the crime pages of the evening mail become part of the forensics of communal memory. But today I only found one eyewitness, Josephine Huntley, I'd heard she often burned the midnight oil, doing paperwork and what not in her office. I found her there on the first floor of Ottawa House. Josephine is approaching stout and is ambidextrous, which I imagine sounds no more than disparate elements, but were things I noticed and learned right off. When I walked into her office, she was pecking away one-fingered on a typewriter with her right hand while drinking a cup of tea with her left.